Good morning, everyone. It is so good to be with you again. FCOC's leadership has asked if I would record the remaining messages in our Why Church series for you to use as needed in the coming weeks, and I'm glad to do just that. This is the fifth installment of the series where we are attempting to answer questions related to the title, the title, of course, being Why Church? We addressed that directly in week one and week two. We talked about what does the church do in week three. Can't I just do life alone in week four? What can I do? And now this week, we're going to answer the question, what should I believe? With so many ideologies and philosophies floating around and with everyone claiming their own version of truth, how do I know as a church attender and a member of the church, a part of the body of Christ, how do I know what to believe? What is my standard methodology when I approach things beyond the physical realm, those things that I can taste, see, and touch? When answering a question like this, we could step through popular belief oratories like the Apostles' Creed or a shorter, more modern version found in the lyrics to a Newsboys song that I really enjoy called We Believe. The lyrics go like this. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. He has given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and he's coming back again. The basic tenets of our faith are all in there for sure. But today is not about telling ourselves specifics on what to believe. Rather, I'd like to frame our approach to today's questions so that each of us in the church can take healthy steps toward discovering the answers together as we move forward in our faith. Today's conversation is more about, the, about understanding the mindset and the heart set that we should take into our relationship with Christ and his church. So we're going to answer today the question, what should I believe? A while back, uh, Disney came out with a, a musical called High School Musical. And uh, they, of course, came out with a number of sequels as well. But in the original, there was a, a portion where um, they played basketball, and one of the star players, of course, had his head in La La Land thinking about a girl. And so the team rallied around him, and they sang this song called Get Your Head in the Game. Your head isn't where it's supposed to be right now. Your head needs to get in the game. If you follow the likes of Tiger Woods or Michael Jordan or Michael Phelps or Simone Biles or any other major sports figure, you'll find out very quickly that sports are as much mental and emotional as they are physical skill, maybe even more so. And the same is true when we approach this question in the church. Our heads and our hearts need to be in the right place when we approach the field of play. How do we get our heads and our hearts in the game when it comes to developing our beliefs and integrating them into our lives to the point of natural obedience and oneness with Christ? Now, I'm going to repeat that because I think that question is so important. How do we get our heads and our hearts in the game when it comes to developing our beliefs and integrating them into our lives to the point of natural obedience and oneness with Christ. You've likely heard me say it before, and I'll continue to focus in on this point until the end of my days, because I believe so much in the, what the, these verses tell us. But let's allow the spirit of Romans 12, 2 to guide us in our discovery today. Let's not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but let's be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Let's rethink these ideas of mindset and heart set in the light of God's word. Today, we are going to briefly explore three different approaches to the same question, what should I believe? And we're gonna start with God's perspective. What is God's approach to this question? In some cases, God has given us some clear and absolute 
truths. There are many references throughout God's word that are crystal clear, beyond question, and relatively easy to understand. 30 times in the book of Matthew, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. And when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, we should perk up, listen, pay attention, and apply. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4 says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Again, words that should leap off the page at us. Of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, just as the scriptures said he would. Now, when the Bible tells us such a clear truth as that, we should we should listen. Again, in, uh, a little bit later in verses 14 and 19, and in, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. This point, the fact that God makes some things crystal clear, goes back to a famous saying often attributed to Mark Twain. He said, most people are bothered by the passages in Scripture they do not understand. But as for me, the passages that trouble me most are those which I do understand. God has made some things crystal clear. In other cases, he has left some things very unclear. For instance, the second coming of Christ. We know it's going to happen, but we don't know when, and we shouldn't. Matthew chapter 4, 20, uh, 24 tells us that no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. This particular ar argument just drives me a little crazy, to be honest. We are specifically told that not even Jesus himself knows but countless hours, dollars, and relationships have been wasted in what I believe, I believe they've been wasted in the pursuit of an answer that will never be found until the day it happens, just like what happened in the days of Noah. One of the essences of God is that he is ultimately beyond us to the point that we could never know as he knows. His ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. This is a reality we should accept and embrace as we consider today's question in our lives. And lastly, when it comes to God and his approach, God has warned us about false teachers. Matthew 7, 15, watch out for false prophets. A little bit later in 2 Peter 2, 1, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought, who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. We've been warned, folks. They exist. Let's not be naive in thinking that everyone that claims to be of God is. And this is extremely important in the digital age. Anyone, and I mean anyone, can write an ebook or produce a podcast or post a blog these days. We need the knowledge, wisdom, and discernment to be able to separate the good from the heretical, God's wisdom from man's, and proper instruction from false teaching. God has defined truth. He's left plenty of room for mystery, and he has warned us of false teachers. But how about us? How should you and I, as individual believers, approach this question in our lives? First of all, we've got to pray. I know this is a bit cliche, and it's easy to say it's much harder to do. But I cannot stress enough how much our communion with God, our conversations with God, are necessary when we are trying to discern what we are to believe. I've heard it said, 
that, uh, you know, when people say, I, but I don't hear God talking back to me. You know, it feels like this one-way conversation and I really don't. And the response to that is that God speaks to us primarily through his word. When's the last time you spent deep contemplative time praying through God's word so that he can speak to us through his already written and revealed word? We need to pray to discern what we are supposed to believe and be open to how the spirit might speak to us in the midst of that. And then to look deep into God's word to figure out what he's trying to say. But let's have some perspective on God's word. This is important. As we are seeking God's word and trying to understand what he would have us to believe, we've got to at least for sure, be sure to put the Bible in its proper context. Because the Bible is not just any book. We believe that the Bible is the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is a beautiful statement about God's Word. But we have to be a little bit careful and keep it in balance because it's a pretty broad stroke statement. But we have to also remember that when this was written, as this was being put together, that the reference to Scripture, you know, the, the New Testament didn't exist at the time. So Scripture was, was the, basically the first five books of the Old Testament. The Pentateuch. Uh, the Torah. Now this is what they were referring to when they talk about all Scripture. So we have to remember that. And that, 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 that's not in any way meant to uh, lessen the importance of what is written in the New Testament or other places in the Old Testament, not in any way, shape, or form, because we do believe that God has uh, given us his word in its fullness. But just remember what's being talked about by this verse. And then to put even more balance to it, in John chapter 5, uh, Jesus is talking, and he says, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So again, as we're reading God's word, we need to be able to put it in its proper context. Even then, in the context of the importance of the scriptures, we have to remember, it's all about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. We have to keep it in its proper context, but we also need to read the Bible for what it says, not for what we think it says or for what we want it to say. As we open God's word, we need to come in with fresh eyes and attention to detail and a desire to be in the moment. We have this thing for finding a deeper meaning, for understanding the story behind the story, but often the message in God's word is more plain than we would like to admit. And so when we're trying to look at what the Bible is actually t saying to us, uh, try to clean the slate and really look for what God's living and active sword, his word, is saying to us in the moment. Different translations can help us to see beyond our myopic tendencies or the way we try to read scripture the same way every time we open to a particular passage. It's easy to fall into a couple traps as we approach the scriptures. It's easy to say, oh, you know, I've read this passage so many times before, I know what it means. Or it's easy to say, I know what I need to know, I'm good. Now this one gets us to the point that we often attribute popular sayings to God's word, and they're not really in there because we don't dig in. You know, sayings like, God helps those who help themselves, or God will not give us more than we can handle, or money is the root of all evil. God's word doesn't say those things. That last one in particular, God's word tells us, that the, tells us that the love of money is the root of all evil, not money itself. But if we aren't continually in the word and reading it for what it says and staying in the moment, we can start to put some things together that aren't really there. Thirdly, we need to consider the literary context of God's word. And just this is an example. Psalm 14, 1 says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Now, if you open a, the NIV study Bible and you look at the fo footnote for Psalm 14, it notes that the Hebrew words that are rendered fool in Psalms denote one who is morally deficient. 
A fool is a wicked or evil person, not a mentally deficient person. So let's put fool in context, literary context. Additionally, heart is used as a symbol for a person's innermost self or their moral core. So saying something in the heart, saying something in the heart, a fool says in this heart, when they say something in the heart, it's a metaphor for moral agency. And finally, in the quote, there is no God, God personifies righteousness. So this quote is a metaphor for a lack of righteousness, not a metaphysical statement on the existence of God. Paraphrasing this first sentence says, the evil man lives as though righteousness does not exist. And this rendering conforms to the rest of the psalm. That's a whole lot different than when we first read that all by itself. So putting particularly the psalms and other uh, um, more literary poetic uh, works in the Bible, we need to make sure that we are putting them in their literary context. We also need to appreciate the historical setting when we're looking at God's word. Who wrote this passage? Who was it written to? Were there cultural issues at work? Were there, you know, that like the scriptures that talk about head coverings or braided hair or greeting each other with a holy kiss? Some people use the cultural settings as an excuse to rationalize bad behavior or to water down the message text, which is not good. But to ignore the role that culture plays can lead to legalism and confusion. Now, a good study Bible will have brief chapter overviews and often has explanatory notes at the bottom of the page for significant issues that involve historical setting. And then the last thing that we can do is we can compare Scripture with other Scriptures. Sometimes people find an isolated verse and use it to justify a lifestyle. In some cases, entire tribes have been known to build a belief system around a single verse. Just think of the proverbial snake handlers. Now, on the other hand, repeated and supporting scriptures that we find supporting one another throughout God's word can and do define a strong position on any given subject. As an example, baptism is found throughout the New Testament. In all cases, it was by immersion based on the base meaning of the word, and it was always a believer that was baptized. A strong case can be made for baptism using multiple supporting scripture texts throughout God's word. So these are all ways that we can try to have a more accurate perspective on God's word. It's not going to be perfect because we are imperfect beings, but we can do better if we keep these things in mind. And then a third thing we can do in our approach to God's word, our approach to answering this question what should I believe, is to pursue additional vetted resources. And that's that important. It's really important that those additional resources are vetted. Back in the day, the apostles were additional resources as the New Testament church was unfolding. Even though they were additional resources and they had a, people really did trust in them. The Bereans were noted, they were praised and held up as an example for examining the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. You would think that if, if an apostle were to stand in our midst and tell us something, that we would just take it for granted. But no, the Bereans were applauded because they double-checked. And there are some amazing authors and speakers that can breathe beautiful life into God's word and the life of Jesus Christ. Let's not shy away from the incredible resource that God has given us in one another. He's truly gifted some in this area. We just have to make sure that we vet them. Now we've framed God's approach and our individual approach to answering the question, what should we believe? How about the church, our collective selves? What team approach should we take? Well, the church's approach, I think, just a couple suggestions is, first of all, we need to have a set of essential and non-essential beliefs. Now, essential beliefs are like the things that we read in the Apostles' Creed or the Newsboys' song. These are the biggies, the ones that we can really, really sink our teeth in and anchor ourselves on. 
But there are also some non-essential beliefs, beliefs that embrace the mystery of God, where disagreement often surfaces, where grace and love should reign. And we need to appreciate, because we are imperfect people, that these things exist. So let's, let's be upfront about it. Let's have essential and non-essential beliefs as a church. And then when it comes to doctrine, why? Why is it so important that the church maintain doctrinal positions? Why don't we just, uh, just, if, just have those essentials and just not even have a position on the others? Well, because doctrine is foundational. In Acts 2.42, we read that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And then as that scripture unfolds, it is just gorgeous. It's amazing. It's beautiful. And everything else in the beautiful passage that follows flows from those four things. They're based doctrinal positions. Similarly, doctrine is a primary element of the church's core and a foundational building block for all of its activities. It is foundational. Doctrine is also, oh, that's the scripture that I just read. <laughs> Doctrine is also purposeful. Now, 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 6. When I left for Macedonia, I urged you to stay there in Ephesus and stop those who were teaching wrong doctrine. Don't let people waste time in endless spec speculation over myths and spiritual pedigrees. For these things only cause arguments. They don't help people live a life of faith in God. The purpose of my instruction is that all the Christians there would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and sincere faith. But some teachers have missed this whole point. They have turned away from these things and spent their time arguing and talking foolishness. Doctrine should always lead us back to Christ and his love. It is not intended to be points of argument or heated debate. They are markers of the faith pointing us to Christ-like living. Doctrine is purposeful, and then also doctrine is uniting. It is not intended to divide us, but rather to unite us. That's why we want to have them written down so the people that uh, can adhere to those can come together in like-mindedness. Ephesians 4, 3 through 4, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. As we continue to consider the question, what should I believe? These three perspectives can be an anchor in the proverbial storm. God's perspective, our perspective, and the church's perspective all play a part in shaping the way we pursue truth, understanding, and wisdom in this arena. But there are also a few obstacles in our way that are worth noting as we close. The biggest obstacles we will face in pursuing the answer to this question include three things. First, our inherited faith. The faith that we inherited from our parents or during our upbringing can get in the way of a fresh look at God's word and an, an evolving faith that learns and grows and, and pursues God. Another thing, thing that can get in the way is our an assumed faith. This idea that I don't need to learn anymore. I got this. I, I'm just, I, I, I'm good. An assumed faith that, that doesn't really lean into what God has to say in today's world, in today's culture, and in today's mindset. That assumed faith can get in the way really fast. And then a third one that we have to be really careful of is a corporate faith. A corporate faith says that Sundays are enough. There's no need for personal engagement. I'm a part of a church. I'm good. These three things can really get in our way of deeply understanding the answer to the question, what should I believe? And you and I must learn to personally embrace our own faith and dive into the pursuit of the answers to this question, what should I believe? Would you please pray with me as we close and consider deeply our answer to this question? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to uh, be able to dive into your word. 
to pray to you, to, to ask your spirit to flow in and through us and to develop a deeper understanding of our faith and of our belief. God, you have ministered to us in so many ways. You have, you have loved us, you have cared for us, and you have placed us in a church, a church of people that love you and that love one another and that are striving to move forward together. And Father, together and, and individually, we need to dive into this question and strive to understand, to learn, to grow, and to be open to the things that you want to teach us moving forward. Father, we have so much to learn, so many, so, so many uh, paths to follow as we seek you, we love you, we care for your people, and we care, Father, for people that are in pursuit of you. Guide us and teach us, and may we humbly follow. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.